Welcome to our webinar this afternoon, this evening, whatever the time may be where you are. I'm Steve Sandusky, and I am very pleased to be able to have a conversation today with Peter Malouk, one of the top financial advisors in the United States. And uh, before we get started here with Peter, I just have a couple of things that I want to mention here. Uh, first of all, this is being co-sponsored with Financial Advisor Magazine, one of the industry's top financial publications. I'm very appreciative of the work that we've been able to do here together. And Financial Advisor Magazine, it's a monthly magazine that focuses on sophisticated financial planning and investing strategies to help advisors better serve their affluent clients. They have practice management ideas and uh, just talk about uh, innovative ways to do financial planning. So uh, if you're not subscribing to, to financial planning, if you're not uh, participating in their newsletters that they send out, I certainly encourage you to do that. I also wanna mention that this uh, conversation is eligible for continuing education. And uh, so we'll, we'll put up uh, some information here. We're trying to get the screen share going. Uh, but if we're not able to get the screen share going for the slide, uh, we'll make sure that we have that available for you to review in terms of the instructions on what you need to do to get the continuing education. So watch your email afterwards here, and we'll make sure that you get that information. So, all right, uh, so uh, what, uh, what I also wanna mention here is um, that this is designed to be an engaging conversation. And so I want you to use the chat box. I want you to ask us some questions. And as you registered for this event, we did ask you to, to share one of the, the things that you're working on in your business. And, and so I got a lot of good information and I basically divided that information into three buckets. And so we've already got a lot of great questions, but certainly want to get some here in real time. And I encourage you to use the chat box as well. And so I see some people are already sending some information in the chat box. We've got Dirk here from Munich, Germany. Uh, uh, welcome, Dirk, from Germany. This is a, an international event, so appreciate that. But in the chat box, why don't you just put like one or two words that indicates how you're feeling about your business right now. Is this some, are you excited about the business? Are you apprehensive? Uh, you know, how are you feeling? Because we're, you know, we're in this pandemic and you know, things have been difficult here for a while, uh, but the markets have been holding up pretty well here. So would love to just see you, uh, what you're saying here in the chat box. So uh, I see frustrated, I see excited, I see cautious, best time ever, uh, excited but nervous, feeling good, anxious. Uh, this is awesome. Yeah, so I appreciate you all sharing that. So, so we may come back to that as well. All right. Um, so also want to, uh, to mention that uh, we have set up a web page. And so after our conversation today, you can go to stevesandusky.com forward slash Maluk. And we will have the replay of this on that page. We'll also have links to some other resources for you. So again, we'll send all that to you in an email after the fact here. All right, enough of the uh, preliminaries here. So now I wanna introduce uh, Peter Malouk. And I, I'm sure most of you are aware of, of, of Peter. He has an amazing story uh, to tell here, and we're gonna get into that. And Peter is uh, the president and CEO of Creative Planning, which he, when, when he purchased the firm, maybe 17 or so, 16 years ago, uh, it had about $35 million in assets. And today the firm is pushing close to $50 billion in assets. So it's an incredible growth story. So just really looking forward to digging into how that growth happened. And it's not just a growth story. So Peter and his firm have been widely recognized in the industry as one of the top firms. And uh, Barron's Magazine named the firm as the number one independent wealth management firm in 2017. Uh, Forbes named it the number one RIA for growth for, for the 10 years ending 2016. And he's the only person to be ranked number one on Barron's top 100 independent financial advisor list for three consecutive years. And Peter is a super smart guy as well. He's got a uh, uh, four majors in his undergrad. He's got an MBA. He's got a JD. He's a certified financial planner. Uh, so not only is he, he's, he's super talented and super smart. So Peter, 
uh, welcome and uh, thank you for being part of our program here today. Good to see you. Good to be with yeah. you, Steve. Yeah, it's great to see you again. And so you're, you're, you're dialing in here from, from where today? Kansas City. Kansas City. Headquarters. Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, I think you are also a part owner of the Kansas City Royals? Yeah, I mean, I, I, a part owner. Uh, the, the main owner is John Sherman, and I was you know, thrilled when I was uh, able to participate in that. It's a lot of fun. And one of my first jobs was working in the visitor's clubhouse and uh, have been to hundreds of games. And I grew up when the Royals were consistently competitive. And uh, so it's just, it's, it was a neat for full circle opportunity and investment to be able to do it. You know, they announced yesterday they're going to play baseball. So I'm, I'm excited that might actually happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it wasn't all that long ago that the Royals were World Series champions. I know. It's been, uh, that was an incredibly exciting in Kansas City, which we had the longest, drought with nothing happening and then to have the Royals and the Chiefs so close to each other uh, do so well kind of reinvigorated the town which is a lot of fun. That's awesome. Great. Well let's dig into the story. So I want to go back to uh, when was it? Was it like 2004 when when you purchased creative planning? That's right. 2000, beginning of 2004. That's right. And the firm had about 35 million in assets? Yeah, they had a few dozen clients, and um, I think we ended the year maybe over a hundred million, if I recall correctly. But yeah, it was a small a small amount across dozens of clients. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to that year. It's two thousand four. You've just purchased this firm. Did you have a vision that sixteen years later, in two thousand twenty, you'd be pushing fifty billion dollars in assets under management? Was that uh, even no? I had. <laughs> right a, I, I honestly, <laughs> when we got started, I thought how amazing to be a hundred million. Uh, there were a couple firms in, in town that I really uh, had a great deal of respect for that managed $300 million, and I thought, wow, if we could ever be that big. Um, it never even occurred to me to think bigger than that um, at that time. I know that you always want to hear that a leader had a vision and realized the vision. I didn't have that vision at all uh, when we got started. I just felt like I couldn't sell and that I wanted it to be really, really good. Whatever we did, I wanted it to be really, really good and have people uh, just come to it and be interested in it. And, um, and basically everything that's happened has exceeded um, expectations um, you know, for a variety of reasons. It's a confluence of you know, a lot of the market moving, uh, moving our way uh, towards the way we're doing things. Um, and part of it, I think, is we're very good at executing on certain things. And part of it's just a, a lot of luck about the way the way the industry unfolded and and how everything is really timing wise evolved for us so was there a point where you said when we started we had no vision that we were going to be of this size did mm -hmm. that vision just evolve over time i mean was there a turning point a pivot where you said you know we really got an opportunity to create something amazing here was there a moment when you came to a realization like yeah, we could be tens of billions of dollars. Yeah, no, the, the first realization I ever had about the opportunity to do something really great was a year ago. <laughs> Literally a year ago, I said, well, it's possible we could get to 50 billion. And from there, I think I could see, you know, what do we do from here? How, how do we get there? And that was probably the first time we actually purposefully executed towards a vision saying, from the technology standpoint, a real estate standpoint, a people standpoint, we really want to be in place to be a hundred billion dollar firm. Until then, it had always been, look, we're in a good position. We're getting a lot of clients. They like what we're doing. Let's seize the opportunity. We don't know how it's going to last and whatever comes, comes. That's literally been the business plan um, from the beginning until a year ago, only a year ago. And it really only happened because we have a headquarters in Kansas City that supports uh, our team all over the country and our clients all over the country. 90% or so of our clients are not in Kansas or Missouri. Right? They're in California, Illinois, Florida, Texas, New York, places like that. And the huge majority of our advisors are in other cities. And, but all of our money management, all of our specialists come out of Kansas City. And our headquarters, we went from covering one floor to two floors to putting people in another building and then adding another building and then adding another other building all in a year. And we realized, okay, wait, it's one thing to grow at 30% when you're 
a $1 billion firm or a $5 billion firm, it's a whole other thing to grow at 30% when you're an 8 billion and then you're a 12 billion and then you're an 18 billion. And so we were spilling over to these different properties and we said, well, what are we gonna do? If we're gonna put everybody together, what does that need to look like? And how, how do I do it in a way where I'm not perpetually embarrassed? I mean, we had, we had our employees parking across the street and you know, and literally in a Merrill Lynch parking lot, we were renting spaces and they were walking over to uh, creative planning. Um, it's just, I'm looking out my window going, this is crazy. We, we need to have enough space for our growth. And then that became, well, what are we gonna grow to? And what do we need the technology to do it? And where do we need the people to do it? That was the first time in our history there was actually any type of planning uh, other than how can we be as good as possible for our end clients? I mean, up until then, that was all we thought about was what else can we be doing for our clients? What else can we do to be better for our clients? And everything else will just come. But real estate, ironically, became something that evolved into uh, where are we really going with this uh, dialogue and a plan that accompanied it. Well, obviously, you also had to be amazing at the execution to continue to grow through all these different levels of growth over the years from 35 million to again, nearly 50 billion. I'm sure there's lots of different levels where you had to reinvest in the infra infrastructure. You had to make big decisions about, you know, what, what, what do we need to take to go to that next level? And so I definitely want to get into that here in a few minutes. Um, before we jump into that though, I want to do a poll. And so I think we're going to end up doing two polls here and this will give us some really good real-time information. So Seth, if you could get the first poll launched here. And what we wanna ask you is, uh, by the time you quote retire, what is the annual revenue that you want to have grown your business to? So we'd, we'd like to get a sense for, you know, what are your aspirations here in terms of the size of your business that you'd like to grow to? So I, uh, you know, we're, we're here on our end seeing the, the real-time results here and we'll give it, uh, a little bit more time for the numbers to roll in. And then when we, uh, when we close the poll, I'll read the results to you. Uh, but there's, uh, looks like one number is coming in to be the most popular. So we'll give it a few more seconds here. So the numbers we're looking at here, um, about 1 million, uh, between one and 5 million, between five and 10 million, greater than 10 million. And then no particular number, I just want to grow. Okay, why don't we go ahead and end the poll there. And uh, let's go ahead and share the results here. So hopefully you're all seeing the results here. So about 12%, actually about 8% of you said that about 1 million. 28% of you said between 1 to 5 million. 15% said between 5 to 10 and 37% of you said greater than 10 million, and 12% of you said no particular number, I just wanna grow. Uh, so, so Peter, looking at those numbers, does anything uh, stand out to you? Anything surprise you about those numbers? That's a lot of people that wanna run multi-billion dollar firms. You yeah. know, it's an ambitious, uh, ambitious audience. Yeah. Um, so, so looking at that, so more than one third said they, they want to be greater than 10 million and, and even, you know, five to 10 million is a huge firm. So uh, over half of the people want to build a business that's greater than 5 million of the people that are on yeah. our call here today. So, so obviously you've, you've gone past that number. So if, I don't know if you can think back to when you were approaching 5 million in revenue, were there any decisions that you were making back then that were important uh, decisions in terms of setting you up for the next leg of growth? Well, I think that you're, there, there comes a point for some people it's at 500 million, for some people it's a billion, some people it's a little more than that, where you have to become institutionalized, meaning the place has to be able to run without you, uh, for starters, and you need to have specialization. You know, the person that's doing the payroll and the HR and the compliance and whatever. I mean, these roles need to be divided up. And so there comes a point where you've got to decide, are you willing to make less profit on a percentage basis in order to build the infrastructure you need to go to the next level? I am not a believer that there's a right or wrong to that. I don't, I don't think that everybody 
uh, should grow. I think you've got to determine, just like we all tell our clients, we'll be begin with them in mind, what are your goals and let's build a portfolio to get you there. I think the financial advisor that owns, owns a practice or even running their firm within a practice, I mean, most of our advisors are making more than owners of advisory firms make. I mean, the majority of them. And I think that um, whether you're inside of a firm or running a firm, you basically have to say, what am I trying to accomplish here? Am I trying to conquer the world? I mean, we have some advisors that are, that are making uh, a lot of money and their goal is to conquer the world. And, or is your goal to make a very good living and have a very good lifestyle where, you know, maybe you're working 30, 40 hours a week and your, your schedule is flexible and you're selective about the client base and you're really enjoying yourself and you're not dealing with the infrastructure that comes from going to the next level. Because the incremental benefit from going from stage one to stage two is not significant. Stage two is kind of the sacrifice of going backwards to get to stage three, right? And so, yeah, I would really start if I was a listener here on what am I actually trying, what am I actually trying to do? We have a lot of former owners that are at creative planning because they're able to make the same amount of income or more and not deal with all of the crap, right? So you, do you, have to own or do you just want to see clients? Do you want to make a lot of money and you're willing to have your life be a little more complicated? Are you willing to make a little bit less to not travel and not deal with all the stuff? And once you know that, then I think it becomes a lot easier to, to lay out a path. Of course, then there's the hard part, which is actually getting the clients, right? I think that's the, the interesting thing about this business is most firms are not growing. Um, we have a, a study from a you know, nationally recognized consulting firm that went through the top 50 firms in the country, and, and on average, they're growing in the single digits. I mean, this idea that firms out there are growing at 10, 20, 30% is a myth. I mean, most of them are not growing, they're declining, or they are barely growing. Um, and I think that that's just the reality of, of the business. Is that's the other part is, can you do it, right? What's the path to actually being able to do it? Yeah, well, and let's go into that. So let's trace a little bit of your path. So again, you start out about 35 million. I think you mentioned after the first year, you were up to maybe 100 million. So um, people can get to 100 million, but then if you 10X from there, from 100 to go to 500 million to 1 billion, you really have to develop some kind of consistent marketing engine. For some firms, they're able to get into the referral programs of the custodians. I know that was a part of your growth for some period of time. As you think of going from 100 million to 1 billion, what are some of your thoughts on, on strategies and what should advisors be thinking about to get that 10x leap? Well, you know, to getting to a billion in, in a certain kind of practice with a big average account, you could almost get there just you being a really amazing advisor with help. But somewhere between maybe 700 million and, and over a billion, you have to have other people doing those things. So now you've got to be somebody that people are willing to work with and for. You've got to be somebody that can afford to pay them uh, no matter what's happening uh, in the markets. You, you've got to be somebody who can train them and support them and handle all the other, other things that they need. So now you're kind of moving from you know, just doing it yourself to running a business. So you've got to be you know, committed to doing that. I think a lot of our growth came from the, the timing. So in the beginning, we were a passive oriented shop. And in 2004, Vanguard did not have ETFs, if I recall correctly, or they had, were just coming out. I mean, and they were called Vipers and Bogle was saying no one should use them. So we were passive investors when most were active. We were using ETFs when most were not using them. We were doing financial planning when most were not. We were giving away the planning, which Every consultant you talked to in the magazine you read said, oh, you diminish the value and no one should do this. And I just believed you can't give advice if, if you don't know what the client's trying to do. How can you possibly advise them? So why would we make that optional? I mean, a doctor can't prescribe medication without a checkup, right? So to me, it was, it was a natural part of it. Those were just things I happened to believe in. Okay, I believed the right way to invest was mostly passive. I believed in a certain investment philosophy. I believed in doing planning. I believed in not charging a separate fee. I believed in hiring credentialed people and all those things. Now what happened is the market moved that way, right? So that's what everyone does today. Cause there's nothing unique about doing financial planning anymore. I mean, there's more firms doing financial planning, I think, uh, than not. And there's nothing unique about hiring credentialed people. Now, now people know that they, many clients demand 
to work with credentialed people. There's nothing unique about doing the plan uh, for free, and there's certainly nothing unique about uh, passive investing. We do other things, but that was a big part of it early. So part of it was just the fortune of the market moving that way five or ten years later, us already being there and having having you know gotten a a really good head start. You know by from 04 to 08, we went from you know very small to 500 million, which was enough to be a top 100 firm in the country uh, at that point. I remember I can't remember if it was Financial Advisor Magazine or whatever in 09 did a list of the top 100 firms, and there we were, you know, at 503 million uh, on that list. I don't think that's going to do it today. You know, I think most of the firms on that list would be two billion uh, or more, and so I think that that fortune of that timing was a big part of that. And then that attracted us to custodians and the other relationships that allowed us to grow. Those aren't as strong of, of platforms anymore. They require more, you know, they want to spread out the, the referral flow a lot more and have more firms and so on. So the timing of our starting point and growth point was, you know, very fortunate. If I was starting today, uh, instead of 16 years ago, and I was doing planning without a separate fee and using passive whatever and hiring CFP. That's not going to do it. It's not going to do it today. So I think part of it was, was a timing component of things and just happening to, happening to do things in a way that later the market accepted as the way things should be done. And then as you look at your arc here, so uh, you mentioned the custodial relationship. So certainly for some period of time, that was a good growth driver. Uh, at one point, you had a relationship with Tony Robbins. I think that was a growth driver. Uh, yep. Now, I think you're moving into acquisitions. You've done some acquisitions. That's a growth driver. And I think maybe you're even thinking about international business. And so maybe if yeah. you could comment on some of those things there. And then I also want to make sure that we talk about what can people do today? So we can't go back and have better timing. But if someone is today right. saying, What's available for me today to grow my business 5x or 10x? You know, we'll, we'll touch on that on the second, second part of the question. But first part, maybe kind of your arc, if you could comment on that. Well, I think that the reality is we've always been doing multiple things. And so kind of the, you know, whenever I get calls from reporters and they say, so-and-so says, this is how you're growing. You know, in the beginning, I said, oh, Peter, you were a lawyer. And so everything's coming from that. And then we started to get in the 401k business and I had a really just great partner in that business. And everyone said, oh, it's all coming from that. And then the custodial platforms, it was all about that. And then it was Tony and you know, now it's acquisitions. And the reality is we, we don't just do one thing, right? You can walk and chew gum. And we're basically trying to do multiple things at once. We didn't do any acquisitions until recently because I, I work, I'm, my personal client base and I still see client, many, many clients, um, most of them were business owners. And I just have seen enough and know enough about this industry and other businesses that you can really screw up a culture with acquisitions. And I think the RA space has a lot of Franken firms in it. They have a lot of firms that are 2 billion or 5 billion or 15 billion, and they're really just 25 firms thrown together and sharing a brand. And you look under the hood and it's just a mess. You can't deliver to the employees of that firm. You can't deliver to the clients of that firm in a setting like that, I don't believe you can. So I think to have a strong tree, you need a strong tree trunk. And I wanted to have a culture, a process, an offering and a system. And it is what it is. You know, our people have defined our culture. So if an, a, a firm that has 500 million or a billion or whatever wants to join us, they know exactly what they're getting. So I think it's great for that firm that's selling. They know what the culture is. It doesn't differ from the Minneapolis office to the Cincinnati office to the New York office. They know what creative is like from meeting the people here and seeing how, how we all operate the same way and act together. So I think that's what's attracted sellers to us. I think what's been great for us is when we bring in a firm, we don't really have to worry about it screwing up our culture. You know, if you had a $500 million firm to a $50 billion firm, it's not really rattling the culture the way it does when you add a $500 million firm to a $3 billion uh, firm and they become the office of that region. We're already in all of these markets. So we're just expanding within those markets, becoming more competitive and high profile in those markets. And so I think the acquisition standpoint, we really had to be at the 50 billion mark to really start to look at that so that it would still be creative planning. It would be kind of, it would be what got us here. And I think that happens, you know, even if you've got a hundred million dollar firm and you're bringing in a $20 million person, that can change uh, the culture. You know, we have lots of employees here, about 700 employees. 
Um, you know, I've had one or two that were like my worst nightmare, you know, come true. And, it, it, you know, my dad always said, you hang out with dirt, you get dirty, right? You don't want to have people around you that cause problems because they, the problems expand everywhere. And I think when you're acquiring firms, you actually magnify that. If you make a bad, hire a bad employee, well, you can just part ways with the employee and deal with all the garbage that comes with that. But if you acquire a firm that doesn't work, and thankfully that hasn't happened yet at Creative Planning, you really have a, a mess on your hands. And so we, the timing of acquisitions was simply, we just weren't ready to do it yet. Um, and I think in terms of the custodians, I would, I would count that and Tony, I didn't control that timing. That timing just happened when it happened. The opportunity was there, but we had done all of the right things to be the firm that those custodians wanted to refer to or that Tony wanted to align with. Yeah. And um, one of the questions that, that advisors often ask and consultants often talk about is this idea of trying to identify your ideal client, trying to come up with a client persona. Now at your size, um, do you do you have quote an ideal client or are you basically you've got different models of service that you can pretty much work with anyone along the spectrum? So how do you at your size think about the ideal client? And then also the second part of that question is for other advisors that might be at the hundred or the five hundred or the five billion. Do you suggest that you really zero in on a particular client? Does that make it easier to market? Well, I think if you, you, one of the parts of your question earlier was, well, what would I advise the, the people listening to do? And I would advise specialization. I, would, I wouldn't even focus on the size of client. I'd focus on a very, very small segment of the market, like people that own horses, people that are dentists, something like that, where you can really create value. So I think the great mistake in this industry is everyone's looking for a shortcut and everyone wants it to be about marketing and everyone wants to like listen to something and then just magically have clients come in. And the, the success story of creative planning is we actually give the clients something that's very good, that they feel like this is better than what I got at other places. The people are better. The offering is better. The advice is better. I'm going to call creative planning when I have a question. I'm going to be confident to refer to them. That's the real value. That's the real service. I think competing from scratch there is harder. So if you are specializing in one group of people, like just orthodontists, you can start to know so many things more than your other local folks can, where you can, um, you can advise them in a way that the competitors can't. You can give them something of real value. So not just from a marketing perspective, but become a master uh, of that area. I think that's the clearest path in a space that's become increasingly competitive and crowded. Mm -hmm. And so in, in your business today, are you, would you say you have any specialization or, or will you pretty much work with anybody? How do you think about that? So our typical client used to be 500,000 to 10 million. That was what the firm really got going on. Um, you mentioned Tony earlier, when we started working with him, um, we had thousands of people that had less than 400,000 that were reaching out to us because we had a book that, you know, a ton of people bought. And so we added an emerging wealth group. And, you know, that didn't, we weren't seeing anybody at that account size before. And now that group has probably 1500 clients or so manages over a billion in assets, has about 20 advisors. That's just been sometime in the last three and a half to four years. So we added that and it's been an amazing addition, uh, extremely labor intensive, you know, kind of expensive operation, but it is fulfilling to reach that group. The, the, we help that group grow and become clients of the private client group. We didn't really have an ultra affluent group officially until about four years ago. Um, once we got to about 25 billion, we started to get more and more leads that had hundreds of millions or 25 million or tens of millions of dollars. So now we have a group that specializes in working with that group, but you couldn't just, couldn't just, I couldn't hang a sign five years ago and say, we, this is what we specialize in because one, we didn't specialize in it and two, nobody would have called. It's the size that gave people the comfort in calling that, Hey, this, this firm clearly probably works with a lot of people. And that's true. You had to get to a certain size to have a lot of those. Now, if somebody calls and they have 80 million, we, you know, we have the full capability to help them, I think, better uh, than most other firms, if not, if not almost every other firm. But that wasn't the case, you know, when we were a smaller firm. We didn't have enough specialists. We didn't have the breadth and depth to do it. So I think picking a segment is tougher. 
I think spick, picking a special a specialization is a clearer path, but then you've got to be willing to walk away from all kinds of business that, um, that isn't going to, it's hard for somebody to walk away from, right? Say so I'm going to specialize in dentists and then you get a referral to a doctor. Are you really going to say no to the doctor? You've got to kind of go all in on something like that, I think, to be successful. Mm -hmm. And when I say financial planning, how do you define that? What does financial planning mean to you in this day and age? And to me, it's not just a retirement projection. It's what should your legal structure be? What should the tax plan be? Where, sh where, what, which investments should be? In which accounts? What's going on with the kids' school? Uh, what happens if you're disabled or have a long-term care need? What happens if you die? What happens if your home burns down or you're in a car accident? Uh, are you in a, a situation where you need asset protection? What are we doing to protect those assets? It has to be more uh, than a retirement projection. And I think then to be valuable, it has to have a lot of depth to it. I mean, you have to be able to go more than a cursory sentence or two on you need a trust. That's not planning. Mm -hmm. Um, let's segue a little bit to marketing. So, so here we are, we're doing a, a Zoom webinar here and in the pandemic, everyone's pretty much been having to use virtual type communication. So how did your firm make the move to virtual? I'd imagine you probably were already having virtual conversations just yeah. through your sheer size, but now that that pretty much was the only way to communicate, how did your firm make the move? How's it working? And is this something that you plan on continuing once the pandemic is over someday? Well, we're actually, even for our size, we still do, we like to do everything in person. So we are putting wealth managers next to our clients. You know, if you call and you're from Montana or Idaho or Utah or New York or whatever, there's somebody there, right, that's gonna come meet with you. That's our preference. The pandemic forced us to convert those to Zoom calls, but our preference is uh, in person. I mean, it's my, you know, somebody's entrusting us with their life's work. They spent 10,000 plus hours, oftentimes much, much more than that, saving all of this money that they then hand to us. Uh, surely we can sit down with them uh, in person and make sure that we really understand what they're trying to accomplish and what they're trying to do. I am not one of those people that thinks Zoom is the same thing. Um, I, don't, I, I think I'd like to see a concert online. It's better in person. It's fine to watch a comedian on Netflix. It's better in person. Um, same thing with this or seeing a doctor or anything else. Now we're using Zoom now because we have to and our clients that want it, look, the advisors are not gonna argue with clients that wanna continue doing Zoom. You know, if it's gonna save them several hours of, of logistics, but our preference is to be meeting people. And what's been the most difficult part of work these days, whether it's something related to the pandemic or maybe not even related to that, but just about where you're at in your business right now. What is the, the, the most difficult part of being Peter Malouk right now? I have, I mean, I have no complaints and I'm not just saying that. I would say it's easier today than it was um, before. So in the, from basically 04, when we got going till 2017, I just couldn't, we couldn't keep up, right? We had a hard time hiring enough people. The number one complaint I would get from employees, we just can't, I can't see all these clients. I can't get to them all. Uh, we, we kind of the real estate is kind of a metaphor for the whole firm, just overflowing and trying to get our act together. And we finally just said, look, we, we are going to hundred, we're going to work towards hundred billion. We hired for it. We put the tech in for it. We put the real estate for it. So I'm talking to you now from a building that's more than a third empty and we still have room for a third more people. Our advisor capacity, we could go from today to 90 billion and not hire a single person. So for the first time we've shifted the whole other way. At the same time, some natural leaders at creative planning have emerged. I mean, if you look five years ago, literally everyone reported to me at creative planning. Well, today there's a head of planning, there's a head of tax, there's a head of law, but there's also a lot of our wealth managers that have shown the capacity to lead and to really grow their own practices within creative planning that are doing a lot of the leading uh, on my behalf. And so today, when I go home at night or when I go on vacation, I am far more relaxed than I was when we were a, a 15, uh, $15 billion firm. You know, when you're our size, you said, well, what do you, you know, what do you worry about? You know, you're, you're, we're getting a lot of attention, right? And so it's, it's, it's just making sure that 
we keep everything as positive as possible uh, all the time because, you know, up until a couple of years ago, we did a really good job of staying under the radar. We made a very, very, very big effort to stay under the radar. And now we've just taken the whole other point of view. We're out there, and if we're going to be out there, uh, we're going to be really engaged. And so that, that perspective is, is a big part of how I see things now going forward, is being more engaged in the community like we are here today and more transparent and open so that there's a little less mystery about everything that we're doing here. Well, you've certainly taken a higher profile on Twitter. And uh, so it, yeah. it's, been, it's been fun to be following you on Twitter and, and seeing your comments and observations about things. Uh, maybe we can touch on that in a moment. But, but I do want to go a little deeper here on the, the, the team, the people. And you've talked about the importance of financial planning. But then also, you've got to have the right people to deliver the planning. You've got to have the right people supporting and running the business. What are, you know, you've, 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 you said you got over 700 people. So you've got a lot of yeah. experience now in hiring people, in trying to identify who are the right people that are going to thrive in this kind of environment. So what are your thoughts on getting the right people in place? Because if anybody wants to grow and the people are on this conversation today because they want to grow, you got to have the right people. So what are your thoughts on getting the people in place that can take you to bigger places? So I think there's two components to this. I think one is, is getting the right people and the other is avoiding the wrong people. Uh, and I always used to have in my mind, just hire the right people, hire the right people. It took me probably all the way until three or four years ago to really get nailed down. This is the type of person I want to hire. And we were, I think, really good at it. That's a big part of the success story. But really moving to a level where the mistakes happen much less frequently, that's very recent. The last three or four, four years, I think we've really figured that out. But I think a big key of our success has been getting really exceptionally talented people. And I think a lot of it has to do with what's your model. I mean, our model is extremely consultative, very high touch, very proactive. And so we need, we need people to be, we need conscientious people. We need caring people. We need very sharp people, very energetic people. There are certain traits that play into that. Um, and so we're looking for all the clues we can to get those kind of people on top of experience and education, which I think is a real thing. Like, I think you really need to have those things. I, I had a call uh, a long time ago with a guy that at the time owned a much larger RIA than me. And um, he had had an employee issue and he was telling me that his goal in hiring was that there's a social curve in society and there's these kind of crazy people out here on the curve. And his interview was, hey, I don't think that how good they are really matters. I'm just trying to avoid the crazy part of the curve. And I thought, well, I strongly disagree with him. I'm really trying to find that top 10%. I've always actively been looking for that top 10%, but I never really thought about the bottom 10%. And it really brought that top of mind for me. And having hired one or two that fall in that kind of outlier category, I am very, very sensitive to, to that part of things too. So really, focusing on who's got the talent to be in the top 10% and do they have any traits that might put them in the bottom 10 culturally, then I don't care how good they are. And so I really, in an interview, try to focus on those two ends of the spectrum. And then how do you do that in an interview? Is it through some questions that you ask? Is it some uh, profiles that you have them complete? How do you discern having the conversation that this person is conscientious, yeah. that they're detail oriented, that they're consultive, you know, all the traits that you're looking for. So there's a couple things that happen before someone gets to me. We do, we do a background check. They're interviewed by our talent acquisition team. They're interviewed by the head of the, the group they're going to work with and sometimes colleagues there, maybe somebody else. Uh, but when they get to me, it's very short and I'm focused on a few things that I, I don't want to give away because it would kind of ruin, I may interview several people every week. <laughs> and the last thing I wanted to do is, is see this, but I will just say that I am very clear about what I'm looking for. And I've got my own way of trying to figure out, you know, do they, which bucket of, do they fall in either of these 10% uh, or not? And it's gotten, it's gotten better. I mean, we've gotten a lot better about getting the right people here. So, so you're looking for that third standard deviation person, but on one end of the curve and not the other. <laughs> That's exactly right. Okay. And, you know, you can be on both. You can be very, very bright, uh, but a total cancer in an organization, right? And so you really don't want to get blinded by someone who may be good, but is just going to cause problems. You really want to find that really, really high, I got to call it a high quality human being 
You need to really start with a high quality human being and then worry about the credentials and, and everything else. Um, they just need a good person uh, at the start. And when it comes to how, the people that actually bring in the new clients, how are you structured? Is it the advisor brings in the new client and is their advisor or do you have a separate business development team that tip, mostly brings the client in and then they introduce them to an advisor? How do you structure that? So we have a lot, a lot of different ways. So most of our clients just come to creative planning. Okay, they've heard of creative planning. They go online, they fill something out or they call us or they're referred by a client. That's a big, big group. And then we assign them to a wealth manager. Um, some wealth managers, their practices are, have, they've been here for a few years. They've grown a book. They're getting referrals from their own practice. Some referrals come uh, from custodians. Some referrals come from uh, people following um, social media, believe it or not, or seeing a, a podcast or seeing us on TV or something like that. Um, all of these different things come together to create different avenues for people to come in. And then we get referrals from other employees here that work in other groups, just like a wealth manager will refer to the tax group, the tax group will refer to the wealth manager. And so it's a lot of synergies that create uh, all of the different pieces of client acquisition. Great. All right. Well, I think we want to do another poll here since we're, we're talking just a little bit. You've been talking about the growth here. So, so Seth, why don't you go ahead and cue that one up there. And uh, this second uh, question here is about how fast do you want to grow? So over the next 10 years, at what average annualized rate would you like to grow your revenue? We've got several options here, up to 10%, between 10 to 20%, between 20 to 30 and over 30% per year. And then the last one is, as long as it's a positive growth rate, I'm happy. <laughs> we'll, we'll give it a few seconds here. As the numbers are rolling in. Looks like there's uh, one percentage growth rate here that seems to be the most popular. And give it a few. About uh, five more seconds here. All right, why don't we go ahead and end the poll. Okay, so just looking at the numbers here, so up to 10% per year growth rate, 8% of you said that. Uh, between 10 to 20% per year, this was, the, this was the most popular at 44%. And then between 20 to 30% per year was at 29%. Over 30% per year was 14% of you. And then as long as it's a positive growth rate, I'm happy, was 5%. So Peter, any of those numbers uh, surprise you at all? Well, I think when I look at the 10 to 20%, that's ambitious, but possible. And so I think that's, that's really a good spot to be. I think even to pull that off. Now, of course, if you've got 10 million, it's different than if you're starting with 120 million uh, or more. But I, I'll tell you at Creative Planning, we have hundreds of wealth managers, and even when you stabilize for book size, there is very, very wide discrepancy on the growth of practices where the referrals come from clients, which tells me it's part of its investments and part of it's the brand and part of it's the planning, but a big, big, big part of it is the advisor. So are you delivering something in a way that the clients find it to be valuable? Do they listen to you when you give them advice? Are they following your advice? Uh, are you asking them uh, to meet other people? Do you have to ask? And I think I've just, I've been amazed at the variance uh, among, you know, different wealth managers at Creative Planning who start at the same time, might have had the same size, but in one year, the, the growth is very, very different. The advisor is a very big piece of this. Just like when you go to a law firm or a, a medical office, the specific or do doctor or lawyer mat matters a lot. And so a really, really big part of that growth rate is you individually as an advisor, are you credible and are people following what you're saying? Yeah, and I think that's such a good point in that they, they could be equally talented, but how much of it comes down to the mindset, to the personal motivation to want to do the extra work that's required to have a higher growth rate? So, so let's start with your mindset. I mean, obviously, you yeah. build this great business. How do you think about the way you think about your motivation, what's motivating you and to continue to keep working hard long past the point where you really need to work for money. I'm, I'm doing it because I feel like, and when I really sat down at, at, 
a couple of years ago when I was looking at these overflowing parking lots and said, you know, I've got to decide here, what are we trying to do? And I always, frankly, was just having fun. I mean, I just had, I love this profession. I absolutely love the people I work with. Um, I'm blown away by how talented uh, they are. There's somebody better here at, at everything uh, than I am. I love working with clients. That's why I still see them. I don't, I could own creative planning and not see clients. I'm an advisor at heart. I'm not an RIA owner at heart. And I can see myself advising clients uh, until the day I die, but I don't know that I will be need to be the owner uh, until the, the day I die because there are like extra stresses uh, that come with that. But when, we, when I was really thinking about where are we gonna go from here, there is an opportunity. We have a chance to be the firm that becomes the first independent wealth management firm that is nationally recognizable. There are money managers, hedge funds that are, but not an independent wealth management firm where if someone wants planning and money management that they think to call, you know, whether they're in Tuscaloosa or Los Angeles. And I think that you get to a hundred billion, you start getting in that conversation. If the hundred billion is really from individual clients, right? Not, not from, it's not 20 or 30 billion from individual clients and hundreds of billions of 401k, which is a totally different thing. I mean, having thousands of clients that are relying on you, you can then put a dent in the industry and change the way Morgan Stanley has to operate and change the way JP Morgan and Wells Fargo. No independent firm is really, none of the brokers have had to change what they're doing. Uh, I think at a local level, you see some pressure on, on the brokerage world, but not on a national one. And I think that would be the great, that would be fun. Uh, that's our goal is to become that brand that can start to get entered into that conversation um, of taking the, those folks uh, on a little bit. And so that's the motivation right now is trying to get the scale to do that. And then as you look at, at the individual advisor level, you take two advisors equally talented, but have very different results in terms of bringing on new clients, growth and assets. Do you, as a firm, do you try and encourage the advisors to continue to grow? Do you just kind of let them do what they do? And what are some of the differences that you see between the advisors who, on a, who are on a very strong growth trajectory versus those who are happy with, with what they're doing? So I think we, we let everybody do what they want to do. So there is no, you've got to do this to be a creative or sign this many people up or anything like that. But what we're not going to do is if somebody says, hey, I want to get to 200 million and manage that and take it easy. Well, then they're, we're not going to send them any more leads, right? So I mean, that we then go, okay, we'll hire somebody else to take those leads. If somebody else is showing enormous success, they're signing people up, they're retaining those clients, they're keeping them happy, they're getting referrals, we'll build teams around uh, those people. And there's everything in between. And so the way I look at it is not really what can that advisor do for me, it's what can I do to get that advisor what they want? You know, if, if they want to have a large client base or a reasonable client, size client base, if they want to run a team, they don't want to run a team, I'm going to make sure that they have every opportunity to accomplish everything they want to accomplish. And I know if I do that, that I'm going to have talented people to work with, right? And so to me, we don't have any targets that anyone has to hit. We don't have any stack rankings that go out where people see Susan's number one and Joe's number two. They know what they're doing. They know what, where they stand, uh, but they're controlling, um, they're controlling their own destiny. They've got the opportunity to control their own destiny. Okay. Well, there's so many questions I want to ask you. So we'll, we'll try and get through as many as we can here in the 10 minutes or so that we, uh, that we have left here. So, you know, let's, let's talk about where you see the industry heading. And I'm sure you're going to continue to do what you do, which is a great job for your clients. But if you look out into the future, is there anything that you're trying, that you're anticipating, that you're seeing on the horizon, whether it's technology, whether it's potential new competitors, is there anything that you're doing today, you're preparing for something that you think may be a big thing down the road that I don't want to miss? Anything along those lines? Oh, I, yeah, I, I think what's coming and it's just going to hit everybody in the face is fee compression. And I think it's coming sooner than people think. I don't know when it's coming. I don't know if it's going to be three years from now or eight years from now, but it's not 10 years from now. And I think it's going to be swift and I think it's going to be severe and I think it's going to devastate uh, a lot of folks in this space. And I think everyone that says that's not happening is in total and complete denial. Okay. First you saw mutual fund commissions, you know, go from eight to five to three to zero Okay, to zero. No one pays a yeah, commission to buy a mutual fund anymore. Then you saw mutual fund fees go from one and a half to one to, if you read books that Bogle wrote, 
15 years ago, he's talking about 1.8%, 1.6% expense ratios. That's not a real thing anymore, right? So now the expense ratios have come way, way, way down. Some ETFs now are at zero, and some mutual funds are three, four basis points. Then we saw custodian fees keep dropping, 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 and then just boom, in 24 hours, all three custodians, or whatever it was, a few days, went to zero. This is what's left. Now, we've already seen what I would call reverse fee compression, I think driven by creative planning and, and firms like us, where you used to charge 1% to manage money, create, creative planning in 04 said, we're gonna manage the money, we're gonna customize it, we're gonna do a financial plan without a separate fee, we're gonna give you legal advice, tax advice, all as part of the service. Now you're seeing that become a norm, right? A lot, all, most firms are offering planning, most firms aren't charging a separate fee. Some are putting an accountant on staff and giving tax advice. That's creating some fee compression because you basically are paying for those things, but you're not passing some of that cost onto the, onto the client. But advisors haven't felt that fee compression because technology has allowed us to be more efficient, right? So what you take six people to do, takes three people to do. As soon as that runs its course, and it just about has, somebody like Creative Planning, I hope it's Creative Planning, is gonna be the first to lower fees substantively. So I am very aggressively trying to get to the scale where we can you know, be on the delivering end of that rather than the receiving end of that. But I think that that is definitely coming to this industry um, in a very big, big way at some point in the future. Does it, are you, you probably don't worry at all about an Amazon or you know, one of these big tech companies that, that comes in and starts working their way into traditional financial advisor territory. Does that concern you at all? Well, I mean, there's already a whole bunch of things out there at 25 basis points or by the hour. And I think, I, I think if an, and I think Amazon will be interesting if they do something like that because they have a good reputation, you know, to most people. And then they come in and start, you know, they do things that underperform and all of a sudden I, I'm not sure they're going to be, I'm not sure they're going to step into it the way people think they will. But if they do to me, it would just be like Vanguard. You know what we, it's going to take a segment, but it won't be the, the blow. The blow is going to be when people can get real high end independent wealth management, which is what your listeners deliver when they can get that at 75 instead of 1%, 75 bits instead of 1%. And then at, 65 bips instead of 75, that's gonna be the real blow. The blow to TD Ameritrade and Fidelity on trading fees wasn't Robinhood coming in at no fee, it was Schwab coming in at no fee, right? Then they had to react, the industry had to react. I think you're gonna see the same thing in the independent wealth management space. There will be external pressures, but ultimately will be a larger RIA that is going to be able to you know, that will strike that first blow that will change that will, I think will ripple through the whole industry much quicker people than people think. Great. Uh, two other things I just want to touch on here before, uh, before we got to jump. So one is diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is an issue, not just in the financial services industry, but just in society in general. So what is, what do you think, what is creative planning, thinking, and doing in this area to make our industry, our sphere, more inclusive and more diverse for, for, for other people? You know, I find it so frustrating to, you know, to watch what's, what's happening on TV and how this is unfolding. Cause I think um, everyone was on the same page uh, with George Floyd's death. And I think what's happened since then is I think there's an opportunity missed to solve real problems. Um, and I, I just hope it doesn't get, get missed. You know, with creative planning, we've always done our charitable giving in the inner city whether it's delivering 500 to 1,000 meals um, to mostly African-American housing projects in Kansas City, unfortunately, or uh, we, we reopened a center that takes people from homelessness to work. We donated uh, to build a building for giving the basics, which delivers basic needs to people and the harvesters that was supporting that community. Um, this, this is all for the, from our inception to now. Those have been the main causes we've supported. And so I'm very passionate about this. You know, we serve the top one or 2% of the population, but we're trying to do our help to the, the part of the population that, you know, is trying to get to the plate to have a shot. And I think if you want to solve the problems, people have to have good jobs. That's not a sexy thing to say, but that's the reality of it is when people have good jobs, that breaks the cycle. Their kids are more likely to go to school. Their kids are more likely to graduate. Their kids are more likely to have good jobs. Um, they're less likely to, to commit crimes and, and do things like that. You're just, that's what really solves the cycle. And to get good jobs, 
you have to have people get degrees. And to have people get degrees, they have to be engaged in school. They have to have a mentor of some kind in the home or out of the home. And they have to have their basic needs met. And so I think that that's where the problem is. And, and anything that we can do to fix that cycle is going to la make substantive, lasting change. I'm not going to insert myself in the middle of the police debate, but let's just say for a second that everybody, that everything that everybody's asking for today happens. Statues come down, buildings are renamed, and not a single African-American is killed by a police officer for the next 10 years. We still have 99% of the problems 10 years from now that we have today. That's not the root of the problem. The root of the problem with the systemic uh, issue is employment. So at Creative Planning, one of the things that we're going to do that's new on top of what we've done in the past is we're, we're committing to, a, to, to build or operate a financial education center. Actually, my next meeting after this is going with uh, our chief diversity officer. We're going to look at the buildings that he's identified. We feel like we've got more talent, talent than any RA in the country. Our headquarters is in Kansas City where 400 of our 700 people operate. Uh, lawyers, CPAs, CFPs, um, we can teach teach this, right? We can teach how to start a business. We can teach entrepreneurship. We can teach tax, law, uh, investing, uh, how to get going on the right path, all of those things. Um, we, we're trying to find a location and then we're going to match to a cur curriculum and deliver that. I think it's things like that, that RIAs can do that are constructive and also not political, right? This, the thing that needs to happen the most, no one should be arguing about. Uh, and so we're going to do our best to contribute in that, in, in that, I think, constructive way. Good. Good. Well, I appreciate you sharing all that. And I know you've got a big, big voice and, and lots of cloud in the industry. So appreciate uh, all that you're doing and all of us, you know, all of us, you know, we have to do our part as well to help improve this situation. So I want to just uh, finish here with some, some of your thoughts on investing. And I'm just curious, yeah. um, I've heard you talk in the past about your investing strategy, but uh, just curious to get your take on some, you know, possibly alternative forms of investing as people are looking uh, going forward. So gold, how do you think about gold? So I, I don't like gold at all because gold is taxed at a higher rate, doesn't produce income um, speculative. We're just counting on somebody else to pay more for it. Long-term rate of return, Great Depression to today, you know, an ounce bought a suit then, an ounce buys a suit now, worst performing asset class uh, other than cash. I mean, I don't understand. And you get all the volatility, right? So I, we want, uh, philosophically, for our clients to own things that pay them something, right? Whether it's an alternative investment or not, we want our clients to get paid. So we're looking for investments that are, that are paying something ongoing. Okay, so I think I know your answer to this next one, uh, digital assets such as Bitcoin. I mean, yeah, if, you, if, if anyone follows me on Twitter, they know I'm a magnet for like that crowd that just <laughs> loves to read me all the time. CNBC, I did a video on CNBC, I think it was like three years ago, and they still run it every couple months, and I just get blasted online uh, by that community when I do it. I, you know, as I said three years ago, I'll say today, there are over 2,000 cryptocurrencies, 99.9% .9 of them are going to be worth zero. One or two of them or three or four will probably work out. Maybe Bitcoin's one of them, maybe it's not. That does not sound like an investment to me, right? So I'm just not, I'm not interested. Well, I own Bitcoin and I own gold. So I'm hoping Bitcoin is that one or two <laughs> right. that actually <laughs> survives. All right, so, well, good. <laughs> so they're, they're like my black, black swan investments here. Sure, um, well, it, it could happen. How about uh, TIPS, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities? You know, our investment policy committee is, is considering that. Now, we decided not to head in that direction. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how rates play out over the next couple of years. Okay. How about private equity? I'm a big believer in private equity, but I think their managers matter a lot. It's, it's kind of my opposite point of view of the publicly traded markets, where I think when you pay for managers, you're, you're paying for high tax consequences, higher fees, higher probability of underperforming. I like passive in the public markets, but I'm a very strong believer in alternative investments. And I think the top private equity guys are better than randomly choosing a private equity guy. So you really have to be very focused on who your managers are, what their experience are, what their track record is. Okay. So anything else in an alternative type of asset class, uh, fine art or anything else that you think yeah. about? Well, I like all the alternatives that are kind of public, public derivatives. So like there's public traded stocks. I like private equity. There's publicly traded bonds. I like private lending. There's probably traded real estate. I like private real estate. Those are the core alternative. We use some others, but those are the core 
alternative investments that, that I like and that we recommend to our clients. Excellent. All right. Well, I think uh, I'm just going to ask you one more thing. Just how would you, what, what's the final word that you'd like to leave with our folks today? I would say, I think it's, you know, it's, it's great that people are listening to you because it means that they're actually trying to do something to get better. Right? Most people are looking for a shortcut, but if you're really focused on how do I get better, ask yourself, if somebody comes and sits down with you, a prospective client comes and sits down with you, are you better than the other nine people they're going to go sit down with? Just assume that before they sign up with you, they're going to talk to 10, 10 advisors. Are you better? If not, why not? Is someone more credentialed than you, more educated than you? Uh, are they more specialized in certain areas that are important in your community, like if you're in Atlanta, Coca-Cola, for example? What is it? And solve those problems. Get, that gets you in a, in a competitive spot with the individual client, and that's what opens the doors to the next steps. There's no shortcut around the fact that you ultimately have to be personally compelling to prospective clients. Yeah, I love that. There's no shortcut to the top for sure. Well, Peter, thank you. This has been fantastic. I appreciate you taking some time here. Congratulations on great this, all the great success for you and your firm, and we'll look forward to having another conversation down the road. Thanks, Steve. It, it was fun, and keep up your great work. Thanks. Take care, Peter.